everybody. I'm really Dr. Dirt. Pat Carroll is just a you know, pseudonym. I have to use at UMD. But I'm Dr. Dirt, and I brought three of my associates with me today. Um, Miss Nima Toad. Nima, take a bow. What's that? It, nematodes don't bow? Okay, so we'll just go like that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Earthworm? I'll, I'll tell them later, okay? Uh, Mr. and or Mrs. Earthworm wants me to explain why one worm can be both Mr. and or Mrs. Later. <laughs> and uh, fungi. Mr. Fungi. And what's that? Uh, Mr. Fungi wants me to tell you that he truly is a fun guy. Okay. Um, yeah, these are my associates. All right, so um, really today what I'm talking about in terms of soil is how I have come to see soil, and that is that it is all about them. It is really all about them, and uh, I didn't know that for a long time but there's been kind of a paradigm shift even among the USDA soil scientists who now think and talk about soil health as being about organisms. And that's a, that's a revolution because um, it used to be all about N, P, and K, sprinkling that on the soil. And even they are coming around to listening to the all right, so soil is, is completely teeming with life. And some amazing factoids about that life are these. First of all, that at least, and I think that percentage is probably going to go up at, as we learn more about that, at least 90% of soil's functions are mediated by life, by living organisms in the soil. Um, there's more living biomass above the ground than below the ground. What's biomass? Biomass is what your biomass, if I took all the water out of your body, what's left would be your biomass. So below the ground on the terrestrial earth, there's more biomass than above the ground. Forests, people, prairies, all of that is less than what's in the ground in terms of organisms. And as far as we know now, there's a lot of organisms out there that surely have not been identified and counted, but now we know that one third of all of the living organisms on Earth are in the soil. That's pretty amazing. So when you know the sheer abundance of these things, when you think about it, some of those facts become a little more believable. So if you think about biomass, so that's just the weight of everything in a living thing except water, beneath one acre of ground, there is the equivalent biomass of 12 horses. In one cubic meter of soil, that's like the size of your dishwasher, right? Something like that. There's about 50,000 earthworms, if it's a happy, healthy soil. 50,000. 50,000 insects and mites. 12 million roundworms, of which Nima is one. If you just look at one pea size, one gram bit of soil, there are 30,000 protozoa, 50,000 algae, 400,000 fungi, and billions of bacteria, pea size. So what I want to talk about today is who are these? And I can't go through all of them. I'm just going to pick some of my favorites, including these three, of course. Um, where are they? in the soil, what functions do they serve, and how can we garden in cooperation with them, right? How can we garden to keep them happy and therefore to take advantage of all of their services? So first of all, who are they? Well, there's the, 
the big ones, the macro ones that we can see with the naked eye or, or with a hand lens or a dissecting, which is not a very powerful microscope. And then there's the micro ones, and those are the ones that we can only see with a microscope, like bacteria, right, and uh, fungi threads and so forth. So um, the first one is... <laughs> Don't let worms near your laptop, that's all I can say. <laughs> The first one is the earthworm, and earthworms uh, are made up of about 7,000 species, 7,000 species. And one really good way to simply classify them is about where they hang out. So there's some that hang out in the litter or mulch. There's some that live in the topsoil. And then there are the ones that are deep burrow dwellers that drill these deep, deep, deep holes and pull stuff way down into them. Those are the night crawlers. And in terms of the northern hardwood forests, those are the bad guys. Those are the ones that are um, destroying the, the litter layer in the northern hardwood forests. Um, Earthworms are little eating machines, right, Mr. and or Mrs.? Yes. Um, they eat their way wherever they're going. So if there's soil in the way, instead of, you know, doing like a mole would do, they just eat their way, nom, 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 munch their way through. And then the soil that was in their way comes out the other end as castings. So castings, we talk about them as worm poop. They're not exactly poop, but... They have been in and out of a worm, and they're all the soil that was in the way. And those castings are really rich in nutrients. In fact, people sell castings, right, that you can add to your garden just to get those nutrients. And some people, like Charles Darwin said, he was a big fan of earthworms. He said that all of the soil on Earth has at one time been in and out of an earth. And sometimes that is not hard to believe when you look at your topsoil. Sometimes it just looks like a whole bunch of castings, right? And maybe it is. Maybe it is all at some point um, has been in that, on that trip, right? So earthworms or castings are a really important um, addition to the soil. Um, Earthworms are really, really important in aerating and mixing the soil. You don't have to till if you have earthworms, right? They do that. That's part of their function. And they, by making those tunnels that they eat their way through, they make pathways for air and nutrients and other critters, and they are the, the great mixers, earth movers of the soil. And if you have a good, healthy soil, your garden should be full of earthworms, and your compost should be full of earthworms. That's a happy soil. Uh, their burrows, you see this little hole here? This is the top of the burrow. Um, not all burrow dwellers at the top are, are the bad guys. The bad guys are the ones that pull stuff way, 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 way down and mix the soil and completely get rid of of the litter layer, but those burrows are the, the kind of create the lungs of the soil, places for air to get in and out and water to move around. Okay, now um, to, to get to uh, Mr. and or Mrs. Earthworm's point, yes, I know you're very, very proud of this. Um, I promised that I would explain another very interesting thing about earthworms, and that is how they reproduce. Each earthworm has both male and female reproductive organs. And what they do is get together, like in that picture, facing their heads facing opposite directions, and they, they secrete mucus, making a slime tube. And the, they pass sperm from one to the other, and then... As they back away, the slime tube picks up that sperm. It also picks up eggs that are on the outside 
of their body and then they kind of wriggle out of the slime tube. It's like they're pulling it, uh, undressing out of the slime tube and the, the wriggled out of slime tube forms these little cocoons, these kind of lemon shaped things. And that's where the, the newborn hatch from. You happy with that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, now uh, these are, besides my three friends here, these are my favorite soil animals. They're called springtails. They're just so darn cute. Um, <clears throat> you can see how big they are by their relationship to that penny. They're arthropods, so they have jointed <laughs> legs, and they have uh, an exoskeleton, and they have a segmented body. And they have these little tails. See that little thing there? It's a little tail, and they can slam that on the ground, and it makes them spring, which is why they're called springtails. Um, and these critters, these springtails, eat fungi. So they're very important in, in the soil uh, food chain. Um, they're also called snow fleas because in the spring, they make their way out of the litter up to the top of the snow, not you know, not like three feet of snow that we have right now, but maybe later on by May or June or something. Um, when the snow's not so deep on the litter, they come up and they're hopping around on top of the snow. You've probably seen them, right? They're tiny, like they, they're about the size of fleas, if you've ever had the fortunate experience of having fleas. Um, but in the, the spring, on a hot, sunny day, um, there can be as many as 500 in a square foot of snow. They're really abundant, right? They're a little hard to see because they're kind of white. Um, you also should have a lot of these in your compost, and usually if you take a handful of your compost and look, you'll see these little tiny white dots jumping around, and those are springtails. Uh, and these are some that we extracted. My students extracted these from compost um, <clears throat> from the UMD farm. Uh, and what another really interesting thing about these is that depending on where in the soil or compost they start out and hang out for their whole lives, um, they can be big. Like this guy probably lived in the top of the compost, it's big and it's dark. It has pigment and it has a tail. If they live way, if they're born way, way deep in the soil or compost, then they don't have any pigment. They don't have any um, eyes. These are called eyes. They're really little light sensor things. You see the little cute eyes there? Um, <clears throat> they don't have any pigment and they don't have any tail because they can't hop around when they're down buried. So wherever they start out, they adapt, their body, their morphology adapts to that environment. Okay, uh, mites are really abundant, really abundant in soil and compost. And um, they, are, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of different time, types of mites. Um, some of them are predatory. The one on the right's a predatory mite, and you see what it's eating? It's eating a little springtail. Uh, they also eat fungi. They eat other mites. They eat nematodes. Um, and these are, I guess you could say they're vegetarians. These mites are eating, they're skeletalizing a leaf, right? So if you have worm bins or compost, they're all over the place, and they're kind of easy to see. Uh, especially if you use a little hand lens. And they, they come in many different sizes, too. Um, <clears throat> one reason, so this, this shows the abundance of them. This is the top two inches of a one square foot plot of forest soil. That's how many mites were extracted from it. They're crazy abundant. You just don't realize it because they're small which is kind of true of all of these organisms. Um, <clears throat> and one reason they're so abundant is that the female doesn't need a male to reproduce, and they, have, uh, they develop an exoskeleton that protects them from lots of, of predators. 
So they have kind of a you know, mighty mite shell or something. <laughs> Um, they're also really important taxis for a bacteria. So one way, bacteria need a film of water to get around. And, you know, in its entire life, a bacteria on its own moves maybe, well, I can't even show it with my fingers, six microns, teeny, teeny, teeny distance. But if they can hop a ride on something like a mite, they can go a lot further to find uh, nutrients and food. Here's some mites we extracted from our um, compost and you can see they come in all shapes and sizes. They look kind of like spiders but um, they aren't spiders although they are um, arachnids. Pseudoscorpions are also arachnids. These are, I've only seen one of these in compost. They're really kind of cool because they look like scorpions except they don't have a tail. Shows you how small they are, right? This is a, a dime here. They're predators, uh, as you might guess, right? They um, secrete some kind of nasty stuff from their pinchers, um, and they eat lots. They eat larvae, they eat ants, uh, mites, flies. They are pretty um, generous in their dietary choices. Beetles, you probably have seen, if not the, the um, adult form of beetles, you've probably seen a lot of beetle larvae in your soil. Beetles are kind of amazing critters. There's about 40,000 species of beetles, and that's only the ones that have been discovered. And 40% of all known insects are beetles. Insect species are beetles, which is... And that's only what, what has been counted so far. There's surely ones that have not been identified. And some are omnivores, some eat plants, some have really specialized diets like dung beetles, right? That you've probably seen pictures of them. They'll roll a great big thing, ball of dung, you know, about 10 times their size and push it along. And that's just one example of a specialization because these beetles have amazing 40,000 species. There's probably an array of 40,000 special adaptations. Um, one really common beetle to see in your compost is a rove beetle. This we extracted from the compost at the farm. See those little springtails lined up by its head? Gives you some idea of the size of it. So you can you can see it with the naked eye and definitely uh, with a hand lens, but you can get a better look at it under a dissecting scope. All right, and Nima, it's finally your turn. <laughs> Don't let nematodes near your laptop either. Are we finished? Okay. All right. Nematodes are roundworms, and um, they are very numerous, very numerous, and there's many types. These are some nematodes that we extracted in the layup. There's over 20,000 species of nematodes. And um, so these, I'll show you how we extracted these later, but these these nematodes are sitting in a petri dish of 80 proof alcohol. And um, one year when we got extracted some, three weeks later, I went and just checked out the petri dishes to see if anything was still moving. The nematodes were as vital as they were the first day. So, um, I mean, maybe they were just really happy, but <clears throat> they somehow survived in ethanol for three weeks. It's kind of amazing. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, nematodes also eat all kinds of things, but what is really beautiful is that they, what they eat um, or determines, or I should say it the other way around, their mouth parts determine what they eat. 
they have very specific intricate mouth parts and I'll show you an electron microscope of these in a second um, they're absolutely beautiful and so this is a nematode that eats bacteria this is a nematode that eats fungi um, if you look at their mouth parts up close right this is under an electron microscope um, but they're absolutely gorgeous designs and they have you know adapted these uh, according to what they what they feed on um, this is a predatory nematode eating another nematode right and there are some nematodes a few nematodes who have given nematodes a bad name in among uh, farmers and gardeners and those are things like the lesion nematode and the root feeding nematode but they are far outnumbered by beneficial nematodes. And um, the thing is that if you have a diversity of nematodes and a diversity of organisms in the soil, you don't have to worry because there'll be plenty of predators for these and it, it maintain, that diversity gives you a balance that makes bad nematodes not a problem. Um, okay, so how did I, uh, how did we extract these things in the lab? It's super simple. It's this thing called a Burley's funnel, um, and you just take a lamp, we use a 25 watt light bulb, and you put some kind of funnel um, with a, with some kind of a um, screen at the bottom. Right. Uh, put your compost in the funnel. A little bit of it. Put the light down, not so that it burns so close that it burns the compost. Of course, you don't want to start it on fire, but you want the critters to feel the heat and sense the light. And at the bottom of that screen, you have a little uh, bottle of ethyl alcohol. And the idea is that they move away from the heat and light and they keep crawling down further and further and further and then when they get into that nice cool neck, it's kind of cruel, but they fall into the alcohol and die and you preserve them, right? And then you can pour that in a Petri dish and look at it under um, a dissecting scope or even with a hand lens and see all of this life. Okay, let's go now to the microorganisms um, and the, the two really important players in the soil are bacteria and fungi. And because bacteria are so small, they're super, super, super abundant. And their lifespan is about a half an hour, so you can imagine how um, if, if, our, if your life spans a half an hour, you go through a lot of generations very quickly, right? And evolution happens very quickly compared to something like us, where we, our generations are, what, 60 to 80 years. But I think that's uh, Mr. Fungi's phone. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so this is, these are fungal threads. Right? And these little white blobs, those are bacteria. Just to give you an idea of how small we're talking here. They're about uh, one or four one hundred thousandths of an inch in size. And just a teaspoon of soil would have something like a hundred million to a billion bacteria in it. Right? And um, because of their lifespan and also the way they reproduce, um, you can, in the lab, you can grow five billion of them in 12 hours, right? It's a little less than out, that out in the real world because there's predators and um, environmental conditions, right? But um, still, they're abundant and they multiply really quickly. Um, so, the bacteria are decomposers. And what they do that's so important in the soil for us as gardeners 
is to um, eat nutrients and act like little fertilizer bags. Their bodies are little bags of nutrients. And so when they are eaten by other things, um, they give those nutrients to the rest of the soil food chain. And as I'll talk about later, they like to hang out by plant roots. So they're right there ready to release nutrients when plants need them. It's this beautiful relationship that has evolved, right, over um, all of these billions of years that soil and plants have been hanging out together. <clears throat> okay, um, so decomposers, that's one of the most important roles of bacteria is their role in uh, taking organic stuff and breaking it down and holding on to nutrients like little packages. Another thing that a lot of bacteria do is that they have some kind of mutualistic relationship with a plant. And one that um, you're probably familiar with is that this certain type of bacteria um, makes with the plant, it makes this thing that is both bacteria and plant called a root nodule. Um, and this happens with legume plants, right? And um, so if you, have, if you have beans or peas, if you pull them out of your garden by the root and look carefully, you'll see these little tiny white balls on the roots. And if you squish the balls, this red juice comes out. Those are... Um, root nodules that just one particular type of bacteria makes with legumes. And the plant gives the bacteria carbon and energy, and the root nodules, the bacteria, give the plant nitrogen. Um, <clears throat> and so if you grow legumes, then all, if you till all that stuff back into the soil or leave it in the soil, you're adding nitrogen to the soil. Right, um, and these are all the these are all examples of legumes. Okay, um, another type of uh, bacteria is called Actinomycetes, and they're kind of weird because they they are bacteria, but they grow like fungi in filaments. So they look like fungi, but they're really bacteria. And what's important about actinomycetes is that um, they do decomposition in situations where bacteria can't. So in drought and dry situations, actinomycetes are really active in the soil. Um, and also in super high pH alkaline conditions, Bacteria, not too many can take it, but actinomycetes can. And they, you've heard of drugs like strep, streptomycin and uh, what's another mycin? Teramycin. Teramycin, erythromycin. All of those mycin drugs are uh, made from actinomycetes. Other thing about these, you know that smell when you first dig into the soil in the spring, that fresh smell, that's actinomycetes because they produce this stuff called geosmin. So uh, I have some perfume that was made from geosmin. It's called dirt. And <laughs> if you want any, I'll just, you can pass around. Uh, give it a second for the alcohol to evaporate before you smell it. And maybe in you know, three months or something, we'll be, you'll be smelling. Okay, um, so finally we get to you, Mr. Fungi. Um, fungi, and fungi are at... Don't let fungus <laughs> in your laptop either, I guess. Um, so fungi 
are really, really abundant and kind of crazy in their morphology. Fungi um, break down organic matter wherever bacteria, actinomycetes aren't happy, fungi usually are. Um, and what they do, their growth form is to grow into branch typhae, these threads that um, grow together in mycelia. So mycelia is visible like these, and the hyphae are the little threads that are making up the mycelia, right? So if you, if you have a log pile, and you know how you can just kind of peel the bark off of the log sometimes, and a lot of that bark will have this white spider webby thing on it, that's the mycelia, fungal mycelia, right? They love um, woody compost, right? So if you have a layer or a corner of your compost that has a lot of kind of twigs or woody stuff in it, it'll be full of these things. And for some reason, my compost in my backyard is very fungi dominated. So um, there's a lot of threads going on there. So um, what is so amazing about this, light, this morphology is that what they do is get on roots. So these are roots of some plant, and then they extend out. And what they're doing is effectively extending the root size, the surface area of the roots. And they extend that by 700 to 10,000 times. So whatever roots do that's good, the fungi make them do it 700, 700 to 10,000 times better. <clears throat> All right, so the, the kind of fungi that do this root infection are called mycorrhizal fungi. And you should have a soil that's full of them. And the advantages of these over bacteria is that um, they can move through the soil, right? So bacteria move about six microns in their entire lives unless they hitch a ride on something like a mite. Um, but these can extend for very, very long distances, right? Some people have said that the largest organism in the world is a fungus that covers a very large portion of I think it was the state of Oregon or someplace, which is uh, the fungus capital of the U.S. Um, they also don't need a film of water like bacteria do to move. Um, and they, what they do then is to transport nutrients great, great distances. In fact, in the phosphate cycle, the P of NPK, what these... Uh, do is to allow phosphate from one plant through the mycorrhizal conduit to go to another plant that doesn't have phosphate nearby. So it, it has created this whole underground transportation system for nutrients and water. Um, amazing, amazing, amazing thing you are, fungi. Um, all right, they also have unbelievable adapt adaptations. Now, Nima, you just, you know, hold your ears through this card. I don't know if nematodes, I just don't, don't watch. Um, one of the adaptations of fungi is to, so these are the hyphae, right, these little threads, to kind of double back on themselves and make these little lassos and then when nematodes swim through them, the cells expand and they, they lasso the nematode and, and strangle it. Uh, and it's a, you know, the evolution. That happened evolutionarily. <laughs> okay, so um, pretty clever. And that's just one of many, many, many adaptations they have because there's so many species. Um, they each have their own strategies. Uh, and as I said, Nima really hates it when I show that, so hopefully she didn't, she didn't see. 
Um. Thank you, Nima. What's that? Okay. Um, please go to nematodesagainstlassos.com if you'd like to support this nematodes rights cause. <clears throat> All right, let's go to some of the other questions um, besides who are they. Where are all of these critters in the soil? Well, there's, uh, I think, six places where they're in abundance. So the litter, or if you're a gardener, it's the mulch part of your garden. So here's some garlic coming up out of some mulch, right? And in that mulchy part, litter part, the um, fungi and mycorrhizal filaments are really abundant there um, because they can handle the extremes. If you're in the litter, you have to be able to handle extremes of temperature and uh, light and moisture. Most animals, organisms in the soil are in the topsoil or the A horizon, right? So right below the litter layer. And they are there because they're getting, they're getting organic stuff from up here in the litter, right? This is the, the topsoil under the litter. Um, but they're not, they don't have to be exposed to all those extremes. So there's way more of them here. And another reason they're there is that's where the roots are. Um, and that's because the, the root zone is one of the favorite places for especially bacteria. Um, so the rhizosphere is this area. It's about a tenth of an inch around a root or a root hair. And the roots secrete this stuff called exudate. And that exudate is full of carbohydrates and proteins, and so it attracts all of those, um, that stuff in the exudates attracts bacteria and fungi and nematodes. And the bacteria and fungi act like little fertilizer bags, again, um, sucking up all that nutrient and then having it available to the pl for the plants when they need it. So this, see all this kind of fuzzy stuff out here? This is a root tip and these little root hairs and this fuzzy area here is the rhizosphere. And this is a, a drawing of it. So the rhizosphere is here and all those little uh, things, <laughs> all those little ovals there, colored ovals are supposed to be bacteria, right? And so this area is full, very rich with bacteria and also um, fungi, actinomycetes. Um, so because the little fungi and bacteria are in there, anything that eats them is also in there, right? So it's, a, it's an area that's just a circus of soil organisms. Uh, the fourth place is humus. And humus, it's hard to show a picture of humus because humus is teeny, 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 teeny particles. It's the ultimate decay product of, of decomposition. And just like snowflakes, no two humus particles are alike. So this is an example of, of one. It's this big, clunky, complicated um, molecule, which is why it's kind of the ultimate decay product, because it's hard to break it down any further. What's important about humus, because it's so tiny, it holds water, it has a lot of surface area, right? So it holds water and all kinds of nutrients attached to it. So humus, really the goal of compost is to make humus. And there's tons of organisms hanging out in and on humus. Um, on, for lack of a better word, globs of soil. So soil particles gather together in 
either blocks or crumbs or globs. And on the surface of those globs is where you'll find, especially you can see mycorrhizal threads there, right? Um, and then in the pore spaces between those globs is where especially larger macro animals can, can move. Um, and so what is so important? What is the function of all of these things? And why do we want to keep them happy? Well, one thing that they do is to form a protective barrier on the surface of plants. And what's really amazing is if you uh, look at any one piece of a plant, there'll be a whole different suite of organisms, microorganisms there, than on a piece of the plant a centimeter away. And if you wait 10 minutes, the whole suite in each of those places will completely change. And day and night they change too. So there's, um, they're covering plants and the, the barrier is against predators, right? Or bad organisms that eat plants like some of those plant-eating nematodes. Um, so the key because of all of that those changes in the suite of organisms is to keep a diverse population of organisms. So the diversity of organisms in the soil equals soil health. Um, they recycle nutrients, right? So one of the things that defines life is that it ends, right? And so everything living dies. And it, a lot of the dead things end up on or in the soil. And what the microbes and animals in the soil do is take that organic stuff, break it down into its constituent parts, pass it along through other animals in the soil food web, right, which passes energy along, and release those constituent parts back to the plants. So it's this big um, recycling system and in fact in that food web underground there's 10 times as much energy flowing as in the food web above ground like where the you know the cow eats the plant and the what eats cows we do I guess people people eat the cows that in that above ground grazing chain so they're 10 times as much because it's so active and there's so many of them uh, so nutrient recycling is very important. If it weren't for soil organisms, everything that's ever died would still be stacked up on the surface of the earth out to space, right? And we would be buried in it. If you think about it, the only reason it's not there is because of that. Um, organisms also... Um, produce nutrients, right? And um, by doing, well, let's just go on. They, what they do in terms of plant needs is that they produce those nutrients in the root zone at the t exact times that they're needed by the plants because the plants initiate this process with the microbes hanging out there in their rhizosphere. Right? So they um, release the nutrients exactly when they're needed, in the exact forms that they're needed, and in the quantities that they're needed. Unlike inorganic fertilizers, right? this is what the microbes do. It's a perfect synergy that has evolved over the billions of years that soils and plants have lived together. Um, they also outcompete disease organisms, right? And the, the key to that is diversity. Again, is a diverse, keep a diverse population. And we'll talk about how to do that in a second if I have time. Um, they provide structure. So gums and just the hyphal threads of fungi group the soil particles together into what I, I call globs, that's called structure, right? And why do you need structure? Because you need the space between the globs. 
Structureless soil is something like this. It's like, would you rather deliver a pizza to uh, a big outdoor concert or to an apartment building, right? If, if you, in the out, big outdoor concert, there's no spaces to move through. There's no identification of, of um, where you're going, right? But in an apartment building, it's kind of a bad analogy. But people are grouped together, right? There's rooms and doors and hallways. So you want structure to have hallways to move through. And it's organic stuff that pulls particles together into structures. Um, to make humus, it's the ultimate goal of decomposition. And let's finally get to the the big question, I'll, I'll try to rip through this um, to be done on time. Um, how can we garden? First of all, is a negative thing, don't use pesticides. Pest, and I think it's probably obvious from everything that I've said so far, pesticides never kill just a target organism. They invariably kill beneficial organisms too. And if you just treat a symptom um, in your garden or in your plants, one particular pest, you absolutely kill other things which are going, and that is going to give you additional symptoms to treat. So it's kind of a vicious, endless cycle if you start on the, the pesticide treadmill in your own garden. Um, the other thing about um, pesticides is that 80% of the toxic chemicals and pesticides end up in the water. No matter what, right, they, that's where they end up. Um, and in terms of fertilizers, if the, if the soil life is healthy, you do not need fertilizers. If the, if the community of organisms is diverse and happy. Um, and that's because um, there is everything, all of the nutrients in all of the forms that could possibly need, be needed by all of the plants are there, right? So um, what happens when you add chemical fertilizers, they're in the form of salts. And the way that plant roots get nutrients is by, it's, it's called um, osmotic um, diffusion. It has to do with how much salt is in the soil water. If you have too much salt from chemical fertilizers, you destroy that process and you actually inhibit the plant's ability to take up nutrients. Um, Organic fertilizers are okay, because what organic fertilizers do is feed the critters so that they can do their thing. So organic fertilizers are all focused on the, the animals and the biodiversity in the soil, rather than just trying to shake on the nutrients. You know, this beautiful thing that's evolved over billions of years in the past, we think that in the past, what, five decades or seven decades of the chemical industry that we've got it all figured out, and we're just going to take a sprinkler, and it just doesn't work. What is beautiful, though, is that the, um, those salts that can mess up your soil from former years of inorganic fertilizers, humus can... Um, can attach to those salts, right? And they can be broken down into other forms eventually. And so humus and composting can correct all the damage that's been done by inorganic fertilizers. So they're very forgiving, right? Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> and kind of... Um, a little, this is my own little conspiracy theory, I guess, but the, the chemical industry um, has kind of pretended that there's a way to grow food without organisms, right? And that is to pesticide the life out of the soil, literally, 
pesticide the life out of the soil. Then sell fertilizers to douse um, the soil with soluble forms of nutrients that what's left is washed away, requiring you to douse again and again and again. And um, each time you decrease because of the salts, the soil's ability to take up nutrients requiring more fertilizer, and you're probably going to have crazy amounts of pests requiring more pesticides. It's a brilliant um, marketing idea, brilliant capitalist scheme. But if you have plenty of diversity, you don't need fertilizers. Um, okay, the third thing is, of course, adding organisms. When you're going to get the soil ready for new plantings, ideally you want to have about 3 to 5 percent organic matter in your um, garden soil. And the best way to do that is compost. If you don't make your own compost, um, you can buy, I personally believe in WLSSD's compost. I think it's beautiful and they have composting down to not just a science but an art. They have a very nice system there. So compost, this is a whole other talk, right? Compost, but compost is habitat for organisms. That's what it is, right? So adding compost is adding organisms. And compost, good compost has a crazy diversity of organisms in it. Um, so if you're going to transplant plants in the soil, you want to dig a hole, put about a 50-50 ratio of compost and native soil. The soil, it, it has sand, silt, and clay in it. That's got nutrients in it. You want that stuff in your, your garden. Um, and in the part that's going to be you know, where the root ball is, you want a lot of compost. And then you can kind of taper off the ratio as you move away and towards the outside of the hole, right? Um, and you really, it's not a good idea to get pure compost touching the plant at the top because it restricts airflow and also can burn the plants because compost is often really black. It absorbs um, a lot of sunlight. Um, my train of thought there. Uh, the other thing, and this is kind of controversial, but um, tilling is not really a good idea. It, it, we have a long-standing belief in tilling um, and kind of this idea that we have to till because of weeds. But if you think about all of that intricate stuff that I've been describing, just like the mycorrhizal systems, Tilling breaks all that up and it has to start all over again. It's not the end of the world to till, but you kind of slow things down a bit, right? Um, and a lot of people in this climate think, look, Pat, after six months of three feet of snow, the soil in my garden is super compacted. I have to, I have to chill, till it up. You don't because the frost heat in the spring takes care of that. Right? And the earthworms, if you've got them, takes care of that. So you do, you kind of have to break up the soil, you know, a little bit to, to plant. But tilling, mechanical tilling, is really kind of destructive. It's not a, you know, a, a game ender like pesticides, but it's, it's destructive. Um, what about weeds? Well, my answer is you got weeds, pull them out, right? Um, tilling is overkill to get rid of weeds. And sometimes weeds are, it depends on what you mean by weeds, but weeds can just be messengers that something's off balance in the soil. So again, compost organisms, diversity, and you're not going to have too many unwanted plants. Um, for planting seeds, you want to have really nicely composted soil. Again, this kind of 50-50 mixture of native soil and compost. Um, some people, this is, uh, you don't have to do this, but some people say, 
um, take compost tea and mix. You can order mycorrhizal fungi spores. I don't know a, a local source for them. Maybe there is one. But you can mix these with compost tea and roll or soak your seeds in them before you plant them. If you want to, if you want to have, um, you know, tons of incipient life on your seed before you put it in the ground. But it's not necessary to do that as long as you have compost. You have organisms that are ready to give those little germinating seeds everything they could want or need. Um, perennials generally prefer more fungi than bacteria. So if you have, um, you know, a corner of your compost or some compost that's more fungally, you might want to put that on your uh, perennials or buy mycorrhizal fungi spores, order them, and put them in um, your, so your soil around your perennials. But again, it's not absolutely necessary. The other thing you can do to get more fungi than bacteria is mulch. Because remember, but fungi are very abundant in that mulch or litter on top of the surface. So to mimic litter, you can mulch. Um, and the, the other thing is to kind of dispel this myth that harvesting plants takes the nutrients out of the soil. Only the soluble nutrients come out with the plants, right? There are plenty of other nutrients available to be taken out whenever the plants need them, when you, you, when you remove plants, if you have plenty of organisms in the soil. And there's native soil, sand, silt, and clay, to be broken down and add further nutrients to the soil. So um, some people say, I, ha I have to use fertilizers because I've been planting in this field and the plants are mining certain nutrients out of it. That's just not really the case if you have tons of organisms. Um, and finally, what's beautiful is if you have had destructive things like flood or drought or pesticide drift from your neighbor if that has a lawn service, um, keep adding compost and it restores the health and life to your soil. And it's beyond time, but I'll just end with this beautiful poem by local poet Ellie Schoenfeld. It's one of my favorite dirt poems patriotism. My country is this dirt that gathers under my fingernails when I'm in the garden. The quiet bacteria and fungi, all the little insects and bugs are my compatriots. They are idealistic, always working together for the common good. I kneel on the earth and pledge my allegiance to all the dirt of the world, to all of the soil which grows flowers and food for the just and unjust alike. The soil does not care what we think about or who we love. It knows our true substance of what we are really made. I stand my ground on this ground, this ground which will ultimately recruit us all to its side. Thank you, Ellie. So my friends will take a bow. I'm sorry to have gone on too long, but please. Oh, they want an encore. <laughs>